Welcome to Deep Tech 315. Our first topic this week, of course, is Tesla. Monster move after that. Uh, earnings up 20%. I'll just do the quick frame in here. What happened? Essentially, the quarter had something for both the near-term investor, which I'd put broadly as the sell-side investment community and most investors, and something for the long-term uh, fan club of Tesla. On the near-term side, uh, we had, of course, uh, margins being better than expected. That key metric was the uh, the operating automotive gross margins. X credits came in at 17.1%. Street was at 14.9. They did 14.5 in the June quarter. So this is the biggest uh, sequential jump for uh, since three years. There's a question I'm going to ask you, Doug. It's related to that jump. Uh, the big part of that jump was related to a revenue recognition from FSD on Cybertruck. And they didn't explicitly say this, but you can kind of piece it together from the transcript. Uh, but uh, based on our math is that if you would exclude that FSD revenue, that bump from the Cybertruck, uh, it would have been 15.8%. Again, they reported 17.1, 15.8 would have been nicely ahead of where investors are at. It would have reverse kind of a six quarter decline in margins effectively. Um, but uh, we'll get to that question in a second, but I wanna uh, kind of round out why there is for the, the near and long term. The second near term was uh, their guidance. They got a deliveries to at a minimum of plus 10% for the December quarter. Uh, the street was looking for a half a percent growth. And for calendar 25, Elon talked about 20 to 30% delivery growth. The street was at 15%. So that's the near term. Long term, I'm calling this the golden carrot that they threw out there. That, of course, being that he thinks that RoboTaxi could do 2 million units, uh, ultimately 3 million. It sounds like it's going to be in production in 26 and start ramping in 27. So my question, Doug, I'm going to jump way back to the automotive gross margins. I mentioned that uh, they weren't, they were great, maybe not as good as they looked because that FSD revenue, do you give them credit for it because this is just kind of part of their business or do you back it out and say it's kind of one time? The, the uh, contrarian answer is actually, you probably need to do both because I think the reality is this quarter, we sort of learned that as you think about Tesla going forward and Gene, you've been arguing this for a while, you know, they're not really just a car company. There is going to be software revenue on an ongoing basis going forward and it is going to be very high margin. I do remember uh, many years ago, probably a decade plus ago, Apple at one point early on in the iPhone life cycle um, changed some of the way they were accounting for the phones. Right. They used to sort of depreciate, you know, the revenue over mm -hmm. a certain period of years Eight and quarters. then they moved to a different policy. That's right. And they moved to a different policy where they were kind of recognizing it all up front, which I think made more sense and continues to make more sense because that's what they do today. Um, I think this is not exactly the same thing. But uh, I do think that going forward, we're probably going to be in a world where we look at the margin on these two different bases. You know, how is the auto piece scaling? Because we do want to see those efficiencies, which we did see a little bit this quarter. And also, how is the software revenue ramping and then contributing ultimately to that gross margin? Because it should be very high margin revenue. Yeah, I guess maybe an ask out there, Travis Axelrod, if you're listening, we'd love to see a breakout between those two. In the meantime, I think you give them, largely give them credit for this. This is, yes, there might've been kind of a little bit more in a given quarter, but that's the whole point. This was not like some uh, odd one-off event. This is part of their business model longer term. And I think that what you said uh, resonated right there. You said that they have a software piece. No other car company has this aspect to it. And I think that they're now just starting to show some of the signs of the benefit of that. Um, I would also just uh, highlight, you know, the concept of this EV winter. It's been a rough go for the last four to six quarters around EVs. But if Elon's right and we grow at 20% next year, let's take the low end of where he is at. Uh, when, when couldn't we conclude to that, that we're we're kind of exiting the EV winter and we're starting to see some more normalized growth. It feels like that possibility is what's really driving the bulk of the move in the stock, at least in my opinion. You know, I think that idea that number one, they've got much better 
growth coming in Q4, which obviously we're already, you know, almost a month into the quarter. So they must have some visibility toward that 10% number. And then heading into next year, that 20 to 30%, if we are in fact out of the EV winter, I think that is a pretty strong tailwind for Tesla because it's been brutal for the last year plus on that front. It has been during that time, of course, we saw a pretty healthy uh, retreat, not full retreat, but call it a 30 to 40 percent CapEx retreat from most of the traditional auto around electrification. I still believe that this uh, these moves that they've made over the past year will come back to haunt traditional auto. Uh, I believe that if we start to see 20 percent year on year growth, going down the road with EVs, uh, for them to try to catch up. Remember, Tesla's the only company that's making money making EVs by a large margin. And uh, eventually, we can debate the utility of EVs, but if you do believe that the world eventually will be electric, there's going to be some painful transition that's going to have to happen for traditional auto. Kind of a subplot to watch here. One last piece, the two to four million uh, cyber cabs that uh, Elon is talking about. Uh, unfortunately, I'll take the under on that. Uh, if you're curious, there's about one to two million Lyft and Uber drivers in the U.S. in total. Not Those drivers don't operate all the time. You can probably get by with somewhere between 100 and 200,000 vehicles that are working 15 hours a day. And so we're going to have to do some more math on that just in terms of understanding there's the global market. Um, but in general, I, I, I'm thrilled to see the optimism around the cyber cab, but I think we should probably add, inject a healthy uh, piece of conservatism in terms of what's the real market for the number of these uh, cyber cabs. Uh, we're going to jump to the second topic, which is anthropic news. This is in the AI category. Super exciting in terms of, uh, I would consider this a, uh, a leap forward in terms of how AI is going to be used by everybody. It is. And I think 2025 is going to be the year of the AI agent. And I think Anthropic is the one who's maybe kind of showing a little bit of the light into that it, coming future. Surprising that it's Anthropic, isn't it? I would have guessed that OpenAI would have probably been there first. I I, I know OpenAI is is uh, working on these features as well. And, and, and Anthropic here has kind of productized it first, at least in a very lightweight way. Um, but I'm sure we're going to see more, I would bet, even before the end of the year from OpenAI on this front as well, heading into next year. But I mean, you know, what, what Anthropic launched, what they're calling computer use, is basically the beginnings of this AI agent era where Anthropic can see your computer, an AI agent can see what's going on in your screen and your computer, and it can use your web browser, it can use you know, your word processing, it can use even iMessage if you're on a Mac. Literally and like a robot perform, that's taking over your machine. It's like if a human, if you gave your computer right. to a human in a way, yeah, it's, and you asked them, could you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Uh, except that the, the human is an AI agent that is fairly capable at most things. And so a few of the examples that Anthropic has shown so far is one that I thought was cool was a sort of a coding agent where they asked the agent to build a website. And so the Anthropic agent goes to Claude AI. So it Can goes you see it to doing itself. All this? Can you see it like navigating your screen? Does it literally take it over? Yeah, literally, you can see like the mouse moving the on mouse. the screen. It types in, you know, in the web bar, Claude.ai. That's fun. Goes to Claude. It asks Claude itself to code up a website. So it codes up the website, takes the code, right, puts it into uh, uh, Visual Studio, and, uh, and then goes from there and kind of runs it locally on the computer. Um, so that's just one example. I mean, you can do anything. You could book travel potentially. Um, you could send text messages, change meetings, but uh, I think we're going to see a, a lot coming out from the agent side Is over the, the next few months. Is the benefit of doing this where you take over your computer because you can use your applications and the computing resources that you mentioned versus why not just create, uh, have a third party, a company started that creates a coding app and you just go direct to that or your travel booking agent app. Why, what's the benefit of actually taking over your machine? It's universality, in my opinion. Uh, it's it's a little bit Makes like sense. the Optimus robot. You could, you could use that as thing. an analogy. I think it's exactly right. Where it's, right. You, know, you could probably build a robot that's more efficient at mowing lawns. In fact, we have. 
but uh, you know, a, an optimist robot with a lawnmower might Steps be able the to real do world. the task in different ways, right? Adjust yep. to, to the real world in different ways. And so that's really the biggest advantage is the, the range of capabilities that the model or the, uh, the agents rather could do. That's awesome. And then last piece, how do they monetize this? Or how do you think they will eventually monetize it? We'll see. I mean, I think number one, this particular product, you have to use their API to access it. And so if you're Again, using the API, you're paying. Ready yet. You got to have some coding skills to do this. Right. Yeah. You have to have a little bit of sophistication to use it right now. It's not something that's packaged and out of the box. We'll get there for sure. Um, but so right now the answer is you go, you ping your API, you're paying, you know, API costs. Um, that's how they'll monetize it, at least for now. Next week's a big week to our third topic here. Of course, the release of 18.1 for Apple Intelligence. Uh, this is a well-documented stage rollout and Apple is rolling out all the top brass. There's been two interviews this week, one with Tim Cook, Wall Street Journal, who reiterated the importance of Apple Intelligence. And uh, second, Federini was interviewed by Joanna Stern and uh, he emphasized that this is gonna take years to fully get up to speed. And so when I see those, I kind of, there's like red lights flashing in my head, like trying to keep expectations low from consumers. I am using the beta right now. I would say that uh, based on looking, seeing those interviews, my bar went really low and it has exceeded that bar, that low bar, at least in this initial tranche of features. Uh, what I'm liking about it is uh, its ability to recommend entire uh, responses to text in my voice. It's like eerie how close it is to my voice uh, and some of the email summaries. The image gen isn't working. I've worked, I've tried to uh, use this to do a better job of uh, finding information in emails. Google does a great job of using generative AI to wrangle up exactly what you're looking for in an email from a long time ago. Um, I'm sure that that will be coming soon, but in total, I, I just want to lay the groundwork for next Monday. I think that uh, the expectations are pretty low in terms of this first, um, first these first features. And uh, I would just add that I'm really liking them. And I think that it's something that even though they're modest, I think it points to just the, the sheer opportunity of adding AI to uh, devices that we use hundreds of times a day. And doesn't need to be rocket science, doesn't need to have um, fireworks coming out of it for people to feel like they're getting value. And um, I just, you know, as you kind of think about this, that as the setup that is going to be pretty modest, um, you know, what, what's your sense about consumers' patience to see this through? You've made the point that uh, 2025 is sort of de-risked in a sense because the comps are so easy and it feels like the bar is low, uh, not just for what people are looking for from Apple intelligence, but also just from the unit volumes as we head into next year. I still think that 26, like ultimately, what do they kind of announce next year in terms of AI product to power that phone, the iPhone 17 in 25 going into the year of 26? Um, that's going to be the biggest, the biggest dynamic because I do think early on customers are going to be pretty loose. They're going to be, they don't have any expectations. Most people don't use GPT all the time. They're not playing with Anthropic right. and Claude and, and using, uh, any kinds of agents. So I don't think like that they have magic big expectations. to them, won't it? I don't, I think magic's probably too strong of a word because when people hear AI, I think they do hope it's at least something that is uh, that's fair. exciting. And, and yeah. I don't know that these features are super exciting. They feel evolutionary versus revolutionary, which we often talk about with Apple. I think we still want to see and hope for maybe that there is something a little bit more revolutionary, a real step up in terms of what Siri can do, not just full text responses, right? And things like that. That's all good, but that's evolutionary. I think the question for next year will be, what is the revolutionary thing Apple can do with AI? Three good out of get out of jail free cards on the iPhone number. We'll talk more about that later. On behalf of Doug and I, bye for now.